in the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is also known as the Sunday of the Passion. I remember growing up on Palm Sunday that we would do the traditional things like we've done here this evening, that we would wave palm branches in the air, that we would sing the songs that include the word Hosanna, which means save us now, and that then later in the service, my pastor growing up would read the account of the passion of the Lord. It would be a combination of the different accounts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as he would read it, I just remember as a kid, wow, that's a really, really long reading. Now, I'm glad he read it because there are so many different things about the passion story that you might not hear other times throughout the year. And even later this week, as we have our Monday Thursday service and then have our Good Friday service, you won't hear every part of the passion stories. And so some things get left out. And so to read the passion story is the goal But the greater goal for a preacher is to make sure that the message of the passion story gets communicated. And so tonight I want to talk in the way that makes sense to people who are following bracketology. And by that I mean people who have been really into the March Madness basketball tournament that has been going on in our country. It has been truly mad this March, hasn't it? Teams that have been expected to do well have done horribly. Teams that were nowhere on anybody's radar have emerged and have even gotten to the final four. Most of your brackets are busted by now if you're participating in any pools. And so tonight, on the sermon notes on the back cover of your bulletin, is a bracket that we're going to fill in together so that I hope that the story of the passion as it's read tonight can, can make sense and we can see it in a way that Jesus is marching toward the championship. So, I already gave away who the winner is, but I guess you realize that already, that Jesus will come out victorious, but who will he overcome? What will he overcome? What obstacles will he face in his journey towards that championship that we will celebrate one week from today? And so as we read the passion narrative tonight from the book of Mark, chapters 14 and chapters 15, we'll hear the story of Jesus in his journey. As my son Noah told me earlier, he said, Dad, you shouldn't call it Holy Week Madness, but Mark Madness, like March Madness, but the madness that Mark records. But tonight I want to begin with your bracket with game number one. And so for those who are keeping score at home, in the upper left-hand corner of your bracket, you can place Jesus, and he's battling King Herod. Now this battle isn't talked about in Mark, it's actually talked about in the book of Matthew, chapter 2. And we hear that story a little bit at Christmas time. And since it felt like Christmas time here in central Indiana yesterday and today with gobs of snow, it's fitting for us to remember what happened to Jesus in the very early rounds. Do you remember when Jesus was born? He was born in Bethlehem. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and then as he was Uh, brought into this world by his earthly parents Mary and Joseph, he soon after his birth was greeted by magi, wise men who came from the east. And as you remember the story of the magi who came from the east, they made a pit stop in their journey to visit with a man named King Herod. Now King Herod wasn't a legitimate king. He wasn't a legitimate king in the line of David. In fact, he was a puppet of the Roman Empire. He was a horrible person. He thought that he was royal, but he was nothing of the sort. And when King Herod heard that Magi from the east had come to visit one who would be referred to as the legitimate king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who was promised of old, he wanted to know more about this. Not because he truly wanted to go and worship him, but because Jesus Christ would be a threat to King Herod. And that threat must be taken care of early. And so in Matthew chapter 2, it tells us that King Herod sent out a dictate that said that all children under a certain age in that region would be put to death. He tried to go at Jesus and get him out of the way at a very early age. But Jesus, by the grace of the Father, was taken by his parents to Egypt until King Herod died and they were able to return to their ancestral home 
their hometown of Nazareth in Galilee, and there Jesus was raised as a Galilean, as a Nazarene. Jesus escaped that early round what seemed to be a defeat. He escaped it because of the presence of the Father and the mission that he had to save the world. Have you noticed how people ever since have been trying to get rid of Jesus? Ever since King Herod, throughout the Bible, people were trying to get rid of Jesus, viewing him as a threat for a variety of reasons. Sometimes today in our world, people want to get rid of Jesus, don't they? I don't really want to talk about him, lest we offend someone. We, we can use a generic term for God, but we better not use Jesus out in the public square. We can't really talk about him in schools. We can't really talk about him at work. We don't want to be, be offensive to people who might not believe in him, but then even sometimes in the church. We don't talk about Jesus a whole lot. And so instead of teaching about Jesus, we replace that with self-help teachings and motivational teachings that might scatter in a few Bible references, but really it's not about Jesus Christ because people want to feel good. People don't want to hear the bad stuff. They want to hear about sin and a need for a Savior. They want to feel good. They want to be motivated. They want to be inspired. And so we trade Jesus for a phony Jesus. And yet Jesus still has his way, doesn't he? No matter the attempts by King Herod or otherwise to get rid of him, Jesus will emerge not only from the first round, but all the way to the championship. And Jesus Christ will be the one who is over all and above all and is among us today as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In that game, number one, we see Jesus and King Herod, and Jesus moves forward. But now we turn to commentary. As we consider the bracket that is before you, we now look at the commentary that is given in the Gospel of Mark. And we look at the Mark madness that begins with Mark chapter 14, verse 1. I encourage you to follow along as I share this passion story with you. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this. And they promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. As that passion story begins in Mark's gospel, we see what's happening in game number two, that Satan comes up from the bottom of the bracket, and Satan works to try to infiltrate into the midst of Jesus' closest followers. Jesus is there, and he is being anointed for his burial. He is being worshipped and adored by a follower. And yet, even in the midst of that, the chief priests and the other religious leaders are looking for a way to take him away and arrest him and kill him. And while that is going on, Satan's not only working in them, but he's also working in Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, one of Jesus' hand-picked closest followers one who had been in charge of the treasury of the disciples, one who was close to the Master, and yet the people knew that Judas had a weakness, and that was money. And that money that they promised to give him 
would take him to places that he may not have realized he would go. As he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over, Satan had his way. And Satan always does that, doesn't he? He works from the bottom and he starts working up. The Scripture tells us in the book of John that Satan is a thief that only comes to steal and to kill and destroy. He starts by destroying the people that are closest to Jesus, but his attempt is to get through them and to go through them and to get at Jesus. And so we see in game number two, Satan will play Judas Iscariot, and you know, my friends, who will win. The commentary continues in Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, Jesus went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. 
Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, for here comes my betrayer. In the third matchup of your bracket, you see that it's not just Judas Iscariot that fell away, but all of the disciples that battled temptation. Temptation is a tool in the arsenal of the devil, is used against the disciples to call, cause them to fall asleep on their master. That when he had asked them to watch and pray, to guard and protect, they were there, and at his moment of greatest need, they dropped the ball and they fell asleep. And by the end of the night, they would all have fled and they would all have gone on the run. The temptation that faces each one of us as human beings is so strong. And it's so strong that Jesus himself endured temptation even early in his ministry. That temptation as a tool in the arsenal of Satan is not only used against us, but it was used against Christ. And it was used against Christ to remind us that Jesus alone can be victorious over temptation for us. And that victory is only found when we cling to him as our champion over sin, death, and the devil. The disciples that night felt that they didn't need to cling to Jesus. And instead, they turned away from him. And temptation ruled the day. The commentary continues in Mark chapter 14. Verses 43 and following tell the story about how the temptation would overtake the disciples and how people among the religious leaders and the government leaders would conspire together against the Holy One. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the Scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus, and when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before him and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, 
struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times and he broke down and wept in the fourth battle of the madness of holy week we see what's happening with the sanhedrin and the noble romans the sanhedrin was the legislative body of the jewish people the senate if you will the people charged with making decisions that had to do with both the religious and civic life of the Jewish nation. And yet at this time in human history, they were underneath the ultimate authority of the Roman Empire, an occupational force that had moved in and that though the Jews had some ability to enforce their laws and and, uh, to give a moral code for religious life, they were not able to do certain things, including the ability to subject someone to death. And so in the battle for power between the Sanhedrin and the noble Romans, the noble Romans will emerge because they themselves had the ultimate power, so it seemed. And the Sanhedrin needed them in this strange alliance in order to get rid of Jesus. Mark 15, verses 1 through 20, tells us now how the semifinals are set in the bracket of the madness of Holy Week. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? Still Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him 
they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. You see what's happening? The temptation that overtook the disciples will now meet Jesus in the semifinal. The temptation, what was there for the disciples and also is very real for Jesus. Remember his prayer in the garden? Father, take this cup from me. Jesus in his human nature wondered, Father, is there a way that I don't have to go through with the beating? I don't have to go through with the suffering. I don't have to go through with this death. He knew what was going to happen. And the temptation now, even though the Father's will had been fully revealed to Christ, that he must go to the cross. Jesus' temptation would be to just get rid of everyone once and for all. To get rid of Pilate. To get rid of the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law. To get rid of every obstacle in his way. And to harness all the, his miraculous powers to call down curses from heaven. And to call down the angels of God to obliterate all of his foes. And yet that temptation would not overcome Jesus the temptation to give up at this point in the journey would not overtake Jesus he would not give up he would keep on striving and why he would do it was only for you for you for you did he journey to the cross on the other side of the bracket we see the other semi-final where the noble Romans and especially Pontius Pilate were the rulers that ultimately received the ultimate authority in their day. And Satan used even the hesitant Pontius Pilate to sentence Jesus to die. Satan uses any kind of instrument as his, at his disposal, including the government. He can use. And he used the Roman government to hand Jesus over. But ultimately, who did Satan use to get at Jesus? He used all of the people. All of the people, not too different from me or for you. The people who in their sin called out, crucify him, crucify him. The people like us, who in our brokenness need healing, and yet we ourselves can't bring that healing. And so in our brokenness and in our pain and our sin, that sin is placed upon the back of Jesus Christ. And Satan, through that, believed that he would win with that confidence that he would win with that confidence that somehow he would overtake jesus and secure the final victory you can see where things are heading but let's read about it first mark chapter 15 verses 21 through the end of the chapter concludes the passion story in the madness of mark a certain man from cyrene Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with Jesus also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. And that, my friends, is where the story of the passion the suffering and death of your Savior concludes for Mark. And yet we know that that's not the end of the story. For soon as we will approach Easter Sunday, we'll turn the page and see the glorious verses of Mark chapter 16. But when we get to that final championship matchup on your bracket, you see what you've expected. Satan versus Jesus. And the venue is the cross. There at the cross in the epic matchup that history in many ways had been waiting for, that the slithering serpent of the garden would now, once and for all, try to get rid of Jesus, the promised one. And yet there at the cross, the promise that was made after mankind's fall in the garden would come to be fulfilled. He will crush your head you will only strike it as heel. That there at the cross, Jesus would crush Satan underfoot. There at the cross, Jesus would take upon death himself and he would swallow it up so that there would be victory. And that victory would come, yes, at the cross. That victory would come, yes, in his burial in the ground and his rest in the grave, but ultimately that victory would come when you put the name on the line that you know is going to be there all along as the champion, and his name is Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus on the final, final entry into the bracket stands as the King of kings and the Lord of lords who has won in 3 O.T. And when you see 3OT on a bracket that you filled out in your pool at work or you see it on the screen when it flashes up a score from a game, that usually means that a team won in the third overtime. But here on this bracket that we filled out together, I want you to keep in mind that as Jesus battled so many other forces from King Herod to the disciples who fled from him to the temptations that he faced, to Satan and his use of Judas Iscariot, the Sanhedrin who were always opposed to him, the noble Romans who handed over him to die, Satan who came from beneath and yet could only gnaw at Jesus' heel. Jesus crushed him, and yet his ultimate victory came in the 3 OT, which doesn't mean third overtime. It means on the third day, he came out of the tomb. And because Jesus Christ on the third day came out of the tomb, he says to you and to me who also will face the reality of death that there is victory and there is life for those who simply trust in him. 
So I pray tonight that as we've had a chance to hear about Mark Madness and the story of the passion from Mark chapter 14 and chapter 15, that it will speak to your heart and that you would be reminded that Jesus' march to the championship was done for you and that what he accomplished by his third day resurrection would bring the victory that this world has never seen before and this world will never see again and the victory that this world has been changed by for eternity. May we receive that word this night. In Jesus' name, amen.